yeah, the, the first half is going to be largely about uh, history. Since I figured, I didn't know how many people were going to show up, but I know we haven't given a talk for uh, a few years, so I'm not sure how well known we are. Yes. We're ready whenever we Okay. Work that she's doing in the private system, but I can't say Ready whenever. Hey, how are you? I was like, I'm going to speak up a little bit. Okay. Well, without any further ado, then, um, uh, I guess we'll get this thing started. Uh, I'm Dave Mikulajic. I'm going to introduce Lee here. Lee is my coworker. Um, at the Antarctic Meteorological Research Center. Um, and so, 14 years ago, in 2008, and probably almost to this day, Lee got his BS degree in Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences here at UW-Madison. The following summer, before he started grad school, he started working as a student hourly at the AMRC. Um, in grad school, he studied teleconnections between ENSO and Antarctica, Greg, and he got his master's in 2011 after which he began working full-time at the AMRC. He's now an instrumentation engineer with the group, is currently a co-PI on the Automatic Weather Station project, and also teaches part-time at Madison College. This past field season was his 11th deployment to the ice, and so now I'll turn it over to him to hear more about that. Yeah, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, so like uh, they said, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the uh, field season and what it's like deploying in a pandemic since uh, last year, well, this past season we were able to go. But the year before that was the first time in 40 years that we did not have anyone in Antarctica, which is very, very strange. Um, <clears throat> so a little bit about our group. Uh, we've been in the building for, like I said, over 40 years, since uh, 1980. Uh, this is our team as it stands at the moment. Uh, this is a combination of the AMRDC group, the Antarctic Meteorological Research and Data Center group, and the Automatic Weather Station team that uh, deploys to Antarctica. Uh, and it's a collaboration between um, University of Wisconsin-Madison and Madison Area Technical College. Uh, we also have partnerships around the world and uh, in other parts of the United States, specifically in Colorado, largely. Um, anyway, so an outline of what I'm going to talk about. So I'm gonna give a little bit of an overview of the history since, again, it's been a few years since we've really talked in the department, and that'll give some an idea of what the Automatic Weather Station program is, how it got its starts, uh, why we need annual site visits in Antarctica, just some of the difficulties we run into, and then uh, some research that we have uh, uh, been able to publish on uh, work from the Automatic Weather Station Network. And then I'll talk a little bit about the field seasons we went through and the difficulties or challenges that we ran into. Uh, so yeah, why automatic weather stations uh, in Antarctica? Uh, basically, huge data void in the world, and these are the uh, persons or the uh, operated stations that are year-round that have people at them. And so that's a very, very sparse network as far as uh, station data. So we want uh, automatic weather stations to fill in those data gaps. Uh, basically. The goal of the AMRC, or now the AMRDC, is observing where people are. So we use uh, weather stations, and we also use satellite uh, observations to get weather, weather data everywhere else, everywhere where there aren't people. And that's super useful. Um, historically, uh, in a reliable automatic weather station has been kind of a absolute need, and, uh, or a holy grail. Uh, so back in the 60s, 50s and 60s, well before you know I was around, um, we they developed various technology. This is also before they could really transmit things up. So these were just set up, measure temperature, pressure, wind speed, wind direction, uh, and then you'd go back a year later or two years later or however many years later or months later, and you would gather that data, and then you would use that. So it wasn't something you could just transmit out, but the goal was, it was remote, so you could just easily deploy it. It was reliable. It wasn't going to break, because as we'll see, um, Antarctica is a harsh place. Uh, it would run year round, so make it through the winter. So solar panels are very nice, but they only work for about half the year. Um, back then, they were also using 
uh, RTGs, radioisotope thermal electric generators, to power them. We can't use those anymore. And again, low maintenance. Again, if it's high maintenance or something that needs to be constantly fiddled with, it's not going to work. You just It's going to break down because you can't have people there during winter all the time. Um, and again, there are various different models, constant improvements over the decades. And again, they look kind of silly. They're basically like giant things on sleds. You pull out, set up, and leave it there. In the 1970s, Stanford got a grant from the National Science Foundation basically saying, hey, build a weather station. Have it transmit out, have it work. Uh, and it was first deployed in 1975. This is the precursor to the uh, AWS program here. They designed a system, they got it working, but they were engineers. And it worked in South Pole um, at uh, or McMurdo Marble Point, South Pole in the mid 70s. And but they're a researcher, or they're an engineer. They developed, they, they weren't interested in maintaining weather station networks or building weather station networks. It originally transmitted on the Nimbus 6. They later upgraded it to the Argo system that we still use today. So a bulk of our network is still transmitting on uh, satellite technology from the uh, late 70s, early 80s to tell you just how little data is being transmitted out. But it's still super, super useful. And again, originally, radio thermal electric generators for power, now uh, solar panels and batteries. And again, basically integrated circuits to run it. And these original ones would do temperature, pressure, wind speed, wind direction. Pretty basic measurements. We've adapted it and improved upon that and expanded that. And again, now they're towers instead of just something you drag out all as one unit. Because it's easier to set something like that up. If it's collapsible, if you can break it down, take it out on a plane, you could fit it into a smaller area and install it more easily. So in the 1980s, uh, Chuck Stearns was, they were searching for a research group to take over the project and develop a weather station network. Chuck Stearns was the original PI in the project, and now it's Dr. Lazara, who's in the audience, which is awesome. <laughs> and basically, they, were the, they, cons they consulted with Stanford to adapt and expand and redesign the system over the years to improve on it. And it collaborated with the various other countries. Antarctica is a unique place. We get to collaborate with a lot of other countries, and it's very amicable. People get along. They don't. It's it's reserved for research, and it works. They people generally share technologies, share data, and everything kind of works out a little bit easier than in a lot of other parts of the world. Um, and again, as I said, we removed from we switched from RTGs in the late 90s. They stopped allowing nuclear power in Antarctica, unfortunately. Well, or fortunately, depending on who you ask. Uh, and so that means I get to haul a lot more batteries, which is fun, I'm sure. And again, these redesigned a few times over the years, 1983 to the current, the current, to be AWS. We don't build these anymore. The parts simply don't exist. Um, and again, we they, they expanded. So they added in uh, relative humidity and snow temperature profiling and uh, delta, ten, uh, de delta T, so you get multiple heights of temperature. And again, this was the start of research and operational use, basically all over the continent. And a general design of this is this. It's basically a three meter tower. You have an enclosure with a pressure sensor in it and the brains. The solar, solar panel and batteries are buried beneath the snow because it's around 200 to 300 amp hours of batteries. For those unaware, that's about like three large car batteries. Two to three large car batteries. And again, it's a single boom, wind speed, wind direction, air temperature, differential temperature measurement, and then something to transmit out. For perspective on how little power this takes for, to run one of these, it's basically a 60 watt light bulb for 22 days will run one of this one of these stations year round. That's fully transmitting everything out, which is tiny. Memory? Original was 256 bytes, again. You can't really do anything with that these days. Now it's uh, 16 kilobytes, which is still remarkably small. And everything is transmitted out via the Argos transmission, or Argos network. And we put these all over the place. We've got about 60 of them continent-wide. 
So in the 90s, we stopped being able to build these, like I said. Parts were no longer available. You couldn't make them anymore. Um, so we decided to switch to a commercial off-the-shelf off -the system from Campbell, the CR-10X. Super useful product. You could do a lot with it. You could, it was a lot more uh, modular. You could program it to do basically whatever you wanted. Um, it opened up new sensors. It allowed us to do averaging thing and a variety of other things, but we still were transmitting out the exact same way. Um, and again, the issue with these were, uh, unfortunately, because you, if you're averaging, if you're transmitting out, you're doing all this work, the, uh, the internal clock would drift, which means your timing isn't perfect. On the plus side, we're transmitting it to the satellite, so the satellite knows what time it re received it, but that doesn't necessarily tell you everything you need to know, which is not a great situation and why these didn't last very long. But again, they lasted for a little under a decade. And then we switched to something slightly better, also from Campbell. Campbell basically was like, oh, these are great, but without a way to correct the time, they aren't super useful. In areas where you have a lot of power, you can set up a GPS sensor, that would correct the time. We don't have a lot of power, so it's a slight problem. So in the 2000s, we switched to the CR1000. These were great, and these lasted for around two decades. They no longer make them. They switched to an more, even more advanced thing, uh, which is great, and we're testing those out now. We're going to see if they work with the CR1000X. Their naming conventions are kind of pretty basic. 10, 1000, 1000X. But anyway, um, this is kind of the standard around the continent that's used by us and other countries. And again, the CR10X was modular. You could, uh, you could do a lot of things with it. The CR1000, even more so. You can add in almost any instrument you can think of, so long as you can talk to it, so long as you can measure so long as it's outputting either by like RS-232, a standard uh, protocol, or if it's sending out voltage, you can read it, you can measure it, it works. And they work in extreme cold. People have tested these down to below minus 80C, and they still work. They still will get accurate measurements, and so long as the transmitter works, which can be a thing, it will transmit out. And so an updated diagram of what these look like is Still the enclosure, still a pressure sensor. But now you have multiple uh, temperature levels. You have an acoustic depth gauge to see how much snow accumulation is happening. You can add in solar radiation sensors, which we have. You have a standalone humidity sensor. And we've done other instruments, like uh, uh, snow flux sensors, um, net radiometers instead of just solar radiation sensors. It's basically, as long as you have enough channels to listen, you can add instrumentation. And with that in mind, this has allowed us to do things like tall towers. In, the two th in 2010, we installed a, instead of a three meter tower, we have a 30 meter tower. So instead, it's basically six weather stations in one. Each level has wind, each level has temperature, a uh, few levels have humidity, we'd like to add more, and we could. Um, and uh, we also have the acoustic depth gauge and a, a net radiometer, which is great. So we're getting a lot more data out of this, and this allows a lot more interesting stuff. And you can see a diagram similar to the other ones, basically just like, yeah. It's a little more involved maintaining something like this, and we'll talk about that as one of the challenges of this season. Basically, you need dedicated riggers that can, can, can maintain something like this because um, it's on a uh, ice sheet. It's differentially loading, differentially uh, having accumulation. And if you don't maintain it, the tower will fall down. And hopefully you're not around when that happens because that's super dangerous. And again, this allows boundary layer research um, and it's located in close proximity to Earth. So from a network, network perspective, this is what the network looked like in 1980. Again, a few stations located uh, by McMurdo in this area, by Bird Field Camp, which was a, a camp that has varied over the years from summer only, full year round, to nothing at all, uh, depending on the year. Uh, Dome Concordia, which is again a Italian and French base, and a French base that's uh, de Monteville. So you can see the collaboration. Now, again, this is a slightly out of date map. This is what our network looks like. And again, you still see the collaborations. All these triangles are ones that were built by us and shipped to other countries. This doesn't include the entire network from those countries. Like, the British have a lot more in the peninsula than just Dismal Island. They're just kind enough to service it for us because we don't get to that location. 
similarly, other countries have other stations. They're just, these are the ones we provide them because we're good at building them and it works out. And this is about uh, 57, 58 stations total. This might seem like a lot of stations, right? It's not. If you look at the map like this, you can see this is like if you were to have every name be like uh, a location name, like different mountaintop uh, look names, you can you can barely see the stations, right? Like I can see it, but I'm standing right next to it. But there just aren't that many of them. So there are huge, huge data voids throughout Antarctica, which is a slight problem. But it's given the logistics and difficulties in maintaining them. This is about as good as we can do at the moment without a lot more investment. <clears throat> anyway, like I said, Antarctica can be a harsh continent. So records and extremes, basically what the station will have to deal with. And since we are in the process of developing our own data logger, I'll talk a bit about that more. We needed to know this because if you don't know what the stations are dealing with, you can't build around that to maintain a network and have a, weather state, a working system in place. So the windiest place in Antarctica is Cape Denison. Average monthly winds 40 to 60 miles an hour. Just that's consistent. Day in day out. And actual wind speeds uh, of greater than 122 miles an hour. So that's on average the windiest place we have to deal with. And the station is right up here. Just hidden in the background. The record wind speed, and I think we have a, we might have beaten this with uh, White Island, Dave can correct me, of 137 miles an hour. We have, I think, beaten this, but uh, unfortunately the windbird, uh, as you'll see in pictures later, got uh, completely destroyed. So when we have high wind speeds like this, we build specific, or we get specific wind speed sensors to maintain, manage those wind speeds. And if we don't use that, the the smaller ones break apart and fall apart. And we've got some broken ones. If you ever want to see them, stop by 951. Low temperature. So this is not the lowest temperature recorded uh, in Antarctica. It's the lowest temperature recorded in our network, which is still pretty cool. Minus 120.3 uh, at Dome Concordia. And again, very uh, just an extreme cold location. So any electronics you have to put in have to be able to withstand that level of cold. And record highs, which is not something you really generally worry about, but still pretty interesting. 53.4, or if you're not uh, thinking sort of in the along the coastal regions, or which is D10 and uh, one four point, uh, Cape Denison, similar to that high wind speed spot, 49.3. So not not too too warm, but it's important when you're looking at data to know what's reasonable and what's not. It's like if you cut off all the data above like 20 degrees Fahrenheit, 30 degrees Fahrenheit, you're going to miss, obviously, high temperatures. So now, like if we're designing electronics and building systems, these are the sort of situations we have to deal with. There are other things beyond just the obvious data that we have to deal with. So challenges that we have to run into. High winds, we talked about that a little bit. Accumulation, the stations get buried. So. A lot of the ones you saw in, in those photos were on rock. Most of them are on snow. So accumulation is slowly getting buried. This is why we need to do it every year. Oddly, melting is a problem occasionally we have to deal with, as you can see. When you have a sublimation location or even an area that does deal with melting, the, t the tower can tip over. It's a slight issue and not something you want to run into, especially when you have a directional antenna aiming at something, the antenna can now be aiming directly at the ground. You're not going to get a whole lot of tape that way. And rime ice, and I'll show you some pictures of that, which is kind of cool. Basically, the entire station just gets completely coated in a block of ice, and then you're just like, well, uh, the wind isn't working. I wonder why, because it's completely, uh, completely solid. Like, like I said, accumulation, this is a station that we vis didn't visit for seven years. Uh, trying to spot this from a helicopter took uh, longer than you'd think. Like, we have GPS locations, but again, we're not constantly getting GPS, so these are moving. They'll continue to transmit until the solar panel, this little bit right here, gets completely covered, because they don't take up that much power, and it usually will last six months to a year past that point. 
Ideally, we get to them far quicker than this, but sometimes this happens where you just run into logistical hurdles and you can't. So this one, it, I believe it took us about 45 minutes of circling in a helicopter, slow, concentric circles getting slightly bigger, which is not the most entertaining way to spend a, you know, 45 minutes and motion sickness is a thing. Um, basically we landed and then you have to dig the entire thing out. As far as rime ice, not surprising that the wind wasn't really giving you any values. Because this is, this, yeah, there's an entire weather station hidden under there. You just shake it a little bit and everything falls off. But this happens consistently, which makes the data, it makes it really difficult and why it's incredibly important that uh, people in our group do quality control. Dave is one of them, uh, Linda Keller is another who, and uh, Taylor, actually. Norton is another person. They're all doing data quality control that's incredibly important because uh, they spot things like this, and it's like, well, that's probably not good anymore. <laughs> and from the same location, those winds, when you have rope and chain, the tower can tilt. And if you have a bolt fail or something fail, because hardware does fail, instrumentation can get thrown from the tower. This is a that same wind sensor. It landed a few feet away, um, and then it still worked remarkably. So incredible high, uh, our high wind speed sensors are built to uh, withstand harsh treatment. And I was shocked, but we got this up to speed on a bench and it was still reading accurate values, which was surprising. Uh, but we still, we didn't just immediately reinstall it. We brought it back, replaced it, and then tested it and made sure it was still working before we ever used it again. Anyway, that's basically the stuff we have, we've had to deal with in the past. Recent science that we've done, we found uh, warming in West Antarctica, uh, or one of the West Antarctica is one of the most uh, rapidly warming regions on the planet. Um, and again, this was years in the making. So that bird station, one of the longest lasting stations that we had, was incredibly important for finding warming because we had a consistent, continuous record, or as con continuous as you can get, in an area where occasionally stations fail, and it allowed us to combine these various stations, these various records, and find warming, which was very neat. And again, you can see sort of these data sets combining and, sh and showing how this warming plays out in the data. Uh, another thing more recently done than that uh, was done by a person who's recently left our group, uh, Carol Costanza. Uh, did the Ross Ice Shelf Climatology, basically taking nearly 30 years worth of weather station data and doing a climatology and finding different regions within the Ross Ice Shelf. So this is an area about the size of France or I think Texas, if I'm remembering correctly. And you find uh, like coastal regions, regions that are impacted directly by the mountains and catabatic flow, and then you have a central region uh, that uh, is sort of on its own and deals with its own situations. And again, you can just look at a breakdown of all the fun uh, weather station data. It's super useful. And again, we find areas that we find warming, Maryland, not, not nearly as much as West Antarctica, and then other areas where you don't see much at all. And uh, work done by uh, Linda Keller and uh, Matthew Lazara, uh, basically a climatology of South Pole. So again, this isn't necessarily from our data, we have data in the area, but looking at the weather station data at the location, we had 50 years plus of uh, data and looking at what happened. Basically, no statistical significant temperature changes, but was slightly decreasing, shorter winters, and that how that impacts operations. So a lot of our research isn't just for research purposes, it's also for um, looking at how it impacts operations because it's important for us and important for other people in the area. And again, uh, average wind speed decreasing in this uh, being significant, max, oddly maximum wind speed is increasing on the opposite side of that, and a decrease in snow accumulation. So sort of, I like to bring up recent stuff. Dave recently finished his master's and worked on uh, extreme uh, warming events and we have an extreme warming event in uh, East Antarctica recently. Who heard about that? The just massive, massive warming in East Antarctica. And you can see, so 
we don't just use weather station data, we also have the composite imagery. Um, you have just a massive influx of clouds and energy, um, and an atmospheric river just slamming into East Antarctica. And this resulted in a, ma a huge increase in temperature. Um, and then this is the, this is Dome C, so that Dome Concordia station. And the weather information from that is right here. You can see just massive changes in uh, temperature here. And I believe it was like a 60 or 70 degree increase in temperature over what amounted to a few days. But yeah, kind of a unique place. So now to talk about what we went through in this most recent field season. Um, so a normal field season, just so everybody knows, is on the same page. We would deploy, we would go to New Zealand, spend a few days there getting our clothing, our gear, go to Antarctica, uh, and then it would be about a week of training. This year, again, COVID impacted a lot of things. It required uh, quarantine. We spent three days in quarantine in Albany. We got on a chartered flight that stopped in Hawaii and almost got stuck in Hawaii. That was no fun. Um, it was an issue with the plane and they were debating how they would have to take us off and that, how that would impact our quarantine. And yeah. Then we got to New Zealand and we spent 14 days in quarantine there. Uh, for the first 10 in one uh, quarantine place, got our gear and finished in another quarantine hotel. So total of about 17 to 18 days uh, in route. Or, and then we got to Antarctica and then we had another week of training. <laughs> so already we've added about three weeks to our, nor or a little under three weeks to our normal deployment. So in a deployment, we usually are spending uh, set six to uh, six to 10 weeks. I, my average is slightly longer than most, but usually our goal is uh, six to eight weeks, sometimes longer, and adding three weeks to that is a, isn't a insignificant amount of time. It's a longer time away, and it directly is, impacts our ability to do work. Because you have a limited amount of time you can do work in Antarctica because you're really dependent on the sun being out. Um, so anyway, those, that, those are the changes in deployment. So our plans were to go to West Antarctica and do a few stations because it was really important with us missing the year before. Logistical hurdles meaning we didn't get anything done the year before that. We were getting into three to four years without doing any work in West Antarctica, which is a massive problem because some of the highest accumulation locations are in West Antarctica, so stations get buried. Fortunately, this year, and I'll explain why in a bit. Um, oh, and then we, after that, we were planning on doing a bunch of work in McMurdo as well, installing some polar climate weather stations. I'll talk about that. We're developing our own data logger again, which is great, uh, and uh, also maintaining certain systems, building certain systems, and collaborating with uh, with other groups that have weather stations in a, in close proximity to ours. And since things went wrong, you always have to have backup plans. Anytime you're working in a field season, you have to have backup plans. So West Antarctica, our plans. Thurston Island, Austin, Kathy, and Bear Peninsula. The goal was to raise two of them and get them working again, because it had been a few years in high accumulation locations, Kathy and Austin, and then repair the wind on Thurston Island in Bear Peninsula. Basically, there were some issues with the wind there. They needed to be replaced and fixed. Unfortunately, due to uh, not, oddly enough, not having firefighters, and uh, so they couldn't fly planes. And finding out the fuel fuel cache that they were going to use to fly the smaller planes for us was 20 feet lower than expected. They canceled West Antarctica for us because they simply didn't have the fuel to fly a plane to any of our locations. Because you need fuel. Fuel is what keeps these camps alive. If you use up all your fuel for flying, you won't have any fuel for cooking or for heat. So slightly higher priority as it turns out. So we were told uh, relatively early in the season, uh, about three, two and a half weeks in, it wasn't gonna happen, which is a uh, bummer because we're relatively confident Austin is completely buried now and Kathy is likely buried now, which means um, I get to fill out paperwork for environmental releases because we have lost stations, which is always depressing because I went I like to say, I went 12 years without losing a station, and now it's gone. Um, but yeah, so 
once this was once we were told this was canceled again shift to backup plans you always have to have backup plans you have to have ways of getting around things um, so we were we told them hey we can't do these things we'd like to have more uh, helicopter time that was limited in availability uh, and we'd like to do a little bit more work in certain areas and they accommodated accommodated that the best they could but again limited resources is kind of the name of the game in Antarctica so we could only do so much so we sort of shifted to um, McMurdo, and we just did the standard work that we do. We had a lot of stations that weren't transmitting, so the, the note I keep on these stations is not transmitting, you have to figure out why and fix it. So we went to places like White Island, and again, I don't know how well you can see this, this wind, windbird is supposed to have an uh, impeller or a, a prop on it and a tail on it, and it's literally broken just completely gone. This is the location we think had a higher wind speed uh, than Minna Bluff, the higher than that 137 mile an hour. And you can see the damage it does to plastic uh, windows. It just destroys them. But this station wasn't transmitting, and it's not just because the windbird was broken. The entire cable, so we run a coax cable up to uh, an antenna, it had completely broken the connector and was laying on the ground nearby. Not really going to be able to transmit particularly well with a completely destroyed cable. So we weren't, so we thankfully had replacement parts along and we, I figured it was something along those lines, either the batteries were broken uh, or it failed, a cable had broken, or something else had failed that we would have to troubleshoot and fix. So we did that. We replaced um, similar thing happened, Minna Bluff, not transmitting, troubleshoot and repair. These are just the notes I like kind of keep to myself as to what you have to do and what you're running into. If you if it's not transmitting, you don't know what's wrong with it, so you always have to be sort of prepared to uh, replace things, fix things, figure out what's wrong and find a way to get it working again before you leave. Um, because the worst thing that can happen is it's not it's no longer working. It's still not working when you leave. Because that means you spent a lot of money getting there and you didn't fix anything. Uh, so again, this one, you can see kind of here, a cable running there. That's a solar panel. Like I said, hardware failures. Things back thread off, uh, nuts and bolts, just vi vibrations tear things apart. And a solar panel ends up lying in the snow. It's not gonna do a great job of recharging batteries face down in the snow. So the batteries were completely dead. Thankfully, again, we plan for these things. We bring along spares and we replace them. And we're just like, well, bring along new batteries. Bring, bring along, which is a lot of weight, but better that than going out there and not being able to fix it. Um, we also got to go to a location called Schwartfeger and install one of our new sites. And I'll go into more detail at the very end about that, called Skomic. Uh, this is, if Dave wants to get into why it's named Skomic, he can do that at the end. Uh, but basically, we had three sites here. Our site, that's the AWS site, Troy Figure, the PCWS site, Polar Climate and Weather Station site, SCOMIC, and a site that's co-located with ours from a group called NIWIC, Naval Information Warfare Center. Uh, they are the group that does operational meteorology, so they do forecasting, and they also have uh, some co-located weather stations and weather stations in the area to support that. And our job was to raise the instruments because uh, short figures getting buried, install a station, this one, uh, to get the new station tested and working, and it lasted 18 days, which is unfortunate. A secondary one uh, that we installed has been lasting much longer. And then also help, because they're, the operational group doesn't generally have winter over stations or as many winter over stations, help them troubleshoot why their system is failing and have issues with that. So fixing their station as well. And that's what we did. We went there, we raised our station, repaired their station, and installed the station. It was a busy day. And then it's one of the few locations in Antarctica, for as sparse as it is data-wise, you've got three stations at one location. Similarly, again, Maryland. This is a sort of unique thing. So we have issues at, for, at this station for a number of years. Wind speed, or wind direction was Faulty. We weren't sure why. We'd replace the windbird, no success. Uh, and this is an area where troubleshooting, again, it's 
one of the unique things about the job where you run into a problem and you're like, well, I don't know why it's not working. Thankfully, we had the parts along to completely replace the data logger. As it turns out, the data logger uh, is measuring about half on the one channel that wind direction was going in on. For whatever reason, the, the voltage, uh, the value was being cut in half. Still not sure why, still trying to figure that out. I don't think it's going to be something we can repair, so we'll just have a data logger sitting around it on one channel doesn't quite work. But that was what it was. It was basically you sit there for four hours trying to figure out why things aren't working. As you, you know, dig and raise stations, and you can see Dave at the top of the tower, me at the bottom of the tower, hoping he doesn't drop things on the head. Uh, and the Nive group working on their weather station again. We helped them out, and we ended up getting everything working, and you can see them side by side, and the entire crew that got to work on it, which is kind of nice. And then, so these are the sort of weird, difficult stations. Things go wrong, try to figure out a way to make it work before you leave. And generally, we were pretty successful this year at that, which is nice. Then there are stations which are much nicer. Cape Verde, annual inspection. It's a location that's close to open water, so you get uh, a lot of uh, corrosion. You get things breaking. You can, unfortunately, the this isn't super like high like uh, clear, but you things start to just fall apart. The back of the solar panel is just like completely exposed. Eventually, it needs to be replaced. But we didn't have just a spare a solar panel along for the ride. But everything else was working. We did find out that the. Uh, when we got there, this antenna was actually pointed down. Thankfully, it's omnidirectional, so it didn't really matter, but just to be on the safe side, tilted that back uh, towards the sky. But yeah, uh, and then you've got other stations where just things uh, aren't, again, stations not transmitting. We ended up having to replace a transmitter. One of the first transmitters, so this is an Argos transmission. First time it failed, we've had one of those fail outright in my time with the group, and probably one of the first that's ever failed. For perspective, we've had these things working, this specific version of uh, the uh, transmitter, for around 20 years, and we've used probably over 100 of them. To have only one fail in that time is remarkable, but unfortunate that it happened, it happened this year, or had, it happened this year. Um, and again, just because I like showing off this, just you're going to see some pictures of Dave and me digging and being buried beneath the surface because a big part of the job, it's not necessarily just climbing, it's everything gets buried and you have to dig down uh, seven, eight feet to get everything to the surface. So again, we knew there that would, this is a high accumulation location in this fight, uh, and basically we had to replace a pressure sensor. It wasn't too difficult. You pull this enclosure off, put a new one on, and swap out the transmitter, and then uh, raise everything else to the surface, which involves some digging. And then get a location that we have, like I said, this, is, this was a weird season. Things went wrong in unique ways. Find the station. This is a state, this is Willie Field. Originally it was located uh, in close proximity to an airfield. Without telling anybody, they moved the road that this was sitting next to uh, last year during, uh, two years ago during uh, the COVID period when no one was on the ice except for a few people. So when we were driving, we were looking, we were like, the station should be here, off, off the road to the left. We drove, 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 got to the other airfield, and we were like, well, where was the station? Did we just miss it? Uh, it turns out they had moved the road about a mile uh, off of that location, so the station was now a, a little under a mile off to the right. So we ended up having to find a different way of getting out there because you didn't have roads, so you couldn't take a truck. Uh, we used a snow snowmobiles and piston bullies, and we found, finally found the station, which was great, and we were able to do the work, basically uh, install a new test data logger, the CR1000X. It's actually working great, and also a PCWS data logger. This was our original test site uh, for Sarah PCWS. Uh, that didn't work particularly well. It failed shortly after being installed uh, two years ago. Uh, this year, it lasted, it's still operational, still running, uh, getting data, which is great, because the side-by-side -side co location lets us know that uh, what day, what, whether or not the data is reasonable or accurate. Again, you have two, uh, I always like the Stefan Hasner to ask the question, if you have two temperature sensors directly next to each other and they don't agree, which one's right? And the answer is you don't know. So you can say that they're close by, they line up, they're both reasonable. 
Um, if you have more, you'd be able to tell a little bit more and have an idea of what's reasonable and what's not. Uh, on our way to these ones, we ended up going to the other airfield and working on, again, another station that wasn't transmitting. We weren't sure why. This one was because of a, a broken cable. And weirdly enough, you, cables that are just sitting there, you wouldn't expect them to break, but occasionally they do. So we uh, moved things to the surface, we got everything working, and we replaced uh, the cable, and it uh, was able to work, though we ended up uh, having other issues and needing the, some parts from that one. So it's still gathering data, but it's in a location that's easy to get to, so we will pull the data when we get uh, down there and replace the transmitter in the future. And finally, we went to, I, I always like saving this one for last because you can see just how deep the pit is. Um, yeah, that's, that's Dave at the bottom beneath the enclosure. And we didn't get to this site for se uh, seven years. Had we uh, not had a COVID year, we would have probably got to it that year. But um, this year, we were able to get to it. We dug down, and it was literally just add tower section, uh, move everything back to the surface, and get it operate. Because it was still working. You can still see the solar panel when we first got there. So it still has power. It's still able to transmit. But it's not optimal. Like Pressure isn't going to be great completely buried beneath the snow. It's, not bad, but it still works. It's still getting you some pressure, but it's the snow is filtering it and impacting it. Um, so yeah, we raised everything back to the surface after a huge, huge dig out, and yeah. Uh, one station that yeah. Good question. When you say you raise it to the surface, do you actually just reposition it on top of the snow, or what, what's what's and what's involved? In that? So ideally, um, we would do that. We would pull everything out. Dig everything up, uh, guy wires everything, and reinstall it a few feet away. Uh, that would take significantly more time than we have in the field. So uh, usually we add tower section. We dig down, recover the power system, which is really important from both uh, a cost saving situation, but also from an environmental. You don't want to be leaving batteries buried beneath the snow, um, though they did in the past. We don't do that anymore. Uh, you add tower sections. You're adding 7, 10, 15 feet of tower sections depending on how much you need. And then you just put everything back at nominal heights and hopefully get back to it more uh, quickly enough that you don't have to do as much digging the next time. Um, so as I mentioned, we have a tall tower. We didn't get to go to it this year. The riggers did. Um, they did a site inspection. Our goal this year was to visit this three times. Once for the riggers to do a site inspection, a second time for the riggers to go and raise the, and uh, another time to basically finalize raising the tower because it's been over a decade in, so it's getting buried. So you want to get it back completely to nominally 30 meters. And then a final time to get the instrumentation all at the correct heights. And also dig up the power system because you can see just everything slowly gets buried. So, it, and it takes a lot of time. In the past, we've had upwards of uh, 15, 20 people here digging, which was great. But uh, this year we were not. We knew that wasn't going to happen. So Dave and I planned for a long, long day of digging in the snow. Uh, unfortunately, that didn't happen. So delays continued. Basically, we've been in we're into year five of not raising the instrument, which is a problem. Um, but hopefully next year, hopefully next year we'll be able to get there. The riggers, thankfully, were able to get out and confirm the station is safe because we don't want to be around a station this size if it's not safe. Um, and in the group, I think I'm the only person who has climbed it, which is fun, but uh, it's good to work on something slightly bigger. <laughs> anyway, as I said, I would talk about our polar climate and weather station. So a partnership between uh, UW-Madison and uh, MATC resulted in a MRI grant to develop a data logger. Uh, I've said a lot of good things about the Campbell Scientific Data Loggers. They're great. Uh, but they are a black box when it comes to how they work on the inside. We already had we had one fail this year in a way that was unexpected, where it was cutting the uh, the wind direction in half. And it's not it wasn't a programming issue because a, the same program on a different data logger resulted in accurate values. So we want to know how a data logger works. We want to know what why it fails when it fails because eventually everything fails, <clears throat> and be able to correct for that. So we will, and we also want to be able to still have the same functionality as those data loggers, just being able to basically going down to the resistor level and be like, well, this failed. 
that biases the measurement or throws the measurement off by this much. We can have a more accurate measurement this way. It also allows us to be more adaptable in the future, which is nice. Um, so we're still in the process of designing and testing these. As I said, we have one that's still working in uh, Antarctica right now. Um, I checked it this morning, and it was working really well, still transmitting perfectly. Um, the only thing that we are having an issue with at the moment with those ones is uh, wind speed uh, and direction, and that's because of a issue with uh, programming more than anything else. But temperature is spot on, everything else is spot on, which is great, which is, uh, since this is a board that was largely developed by students at uh, MATC. Any questions on what it's like, you know, field season-wise and fun in Antarctica? <laughs> And oh yeah, the final thing, the pictures everyone comes for, penguins. <laughs> And we do helicopter work, we do twin otter work. There are different types of aircraft that get us places, or we take snow machines and things like that. Uh, generally with a helicopter, uh, depending on who's going out the field, we can be left behind. Sometimes it's, you have six hours before they're coming back to get you, eight hours before they're coming back to get you. Sometimes it's less time than that. Other times they'll just stay with you. Uh, if it's a short period of time, they have the open availability, they'll just stay there and that makes it a lot easier. If you're with a plane, the twin otter, twin engine, and aircraft, they generally stay with you because it's further afield, more difficult to get to, and they don't want to leave you stranded there. They do leave you with stuff there where if you are stranded, you will be able to set up a tent, which I haven't had to do, thankfully, and hope to never have to do. I mean, I've set up a tent, I've worked, I've worked in a deep field camp, but you never want to be in a situation where you get left by a helicopter and they can't come back to get you because that usually means bad weather is set in and you could be stuck there for days. you ever have to lower the stations instead of raise them? Um, no, generally not. Um, <clears throat> the only the only thing sometimes you have to like uh, adjust heights to be back to like if you're on rock and you take everything off uh, and you say you have to replace an entire station, you want to get it back so everything's consistent because you want the heights to be the same. So you aim to get it and you check your notes and it's like oh this is slightly too high you have to lower it down. That'd be the clo that'd be the most. Uh, the closest option to that, but generally, no, you're not going to have to lower. So it means the snow's getting deeper and deeper with time. Yes, uh, in in every location except for the one station that we had. Uh, if Matt wants to chime in, uh, that that one where it was tipping over, and that was because it was a uh, sort of an ice field type situation. And then you're not lowering the station; the station's going to tip over because there's you can't really like go much further down because if it, if you have to lower the station, the station probably tipped over. And that's a problem. We we've only had one station. Um, sublimate, you know, away that we got to start So, the yeah. DC site was on an ice stream, and that's what they just said that's it, we're moving it and go back. Yeah. There are places in Arctica that we don't install blue ice fields okay. because of ablation, literally. The yeah. snow's ablated away. We anchor in the station will warm up over in a couple of years. And usually those are high wind speed locations yeah. as well. And so, if you if it, the anchors ablate away, the station will get blown. Mm -hmm. It'll just become an Antarctic tunnel. Do you not check on stations if they're still transmitting good data, or do you still expect them like every certain number of years? So it's, our goal is to visit each site uh, every three to four years. That obviously doesn't happen because logistically we don't get that many flight hours. Um, so if a station is still transmitting good data, it becomes less of a priority. Our priority becomes first, it's sort of like the triage. If it's broken, fix it and that becomes highest priority. If there's nothing broken, which never happens, but if, if it got to that point, it would be, okay, what haven't we visited most recently that has an accumulation point? If it's on rock, we don't have to visit it that often because it's not accumulating, not getting buried. Still important to visit because uh, things can break them, as shown in any number of those photos. Uh, the rock sites get uh, beat up because you have high wind speed, you have uh, uh, dust and dirt, that's just slowly, uh, basically destroying the, any plastic you've got on the thing. But yeah, it's uh, the goal is uh, if we don't have any other uh, priority reason, 
the site we haven't visited the most recently is the highest priority. So it's like, yeah, it's still transmitting good data. We still want to go to that site and make sure it's not going to be completely buried because much fun as those pictures of uh, seven, eight, to 10 feet of snow above our heads, um, it's not fun to do that. <laughs> it's not a fun day of just dig all day and yeah, then use the tower to climb out. Kathy AWS is, I assume, not transmitting any data. That's why it is. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Austin and Kathy are both gone. Yeah, we're we're because we have rotation then to go to those. No, no, we're gonna go. Okay. Yeah, they're on our list. Um, uh, and the, part of the reason we're confident Kathy is gone is because we have pictures of where the uh, uh, acoustic distance gauge was, and we saw that go to zero. <laughs> um, so it's it's like, well, we know that's buried. And we know how, much, how quickly it's accumulating. So it might not be completely buried at this point, but by the time we get to it next year, it will be. Austin, on the other hand, we were confident it was buried. We, we weren't confident we'd be able to find it last year, let alone this coming season. Right. Yeah, it's going to be a challenge. So yeah. Oh. yeah. Can you see these from satellite to assess damage? Uh, assess damage, no. Can we see them from satellite? Yes. Uh, the, there's a group, PGC, Polar uh, Geospatial Center in uh, Minnesota, that uh, they deploy, they, we have a standing agreement with them where they use the satellites they have access to, which is including spy satellites from what I've been told. Um, they, the, if they're passing overhead, they will snap shots of them if they are in uh, clear weather, which isn't always the case. So they get the most recent image they can, and you can get some imagery of them, but you're not getting like, oh, we can't see, oh, that's broken. We can't see a cable that's like falling well, maybe off. Maybe if it's a barrier. Oh yeah, I mean, we if we if it's if you're looking in the GPS location and you're like, okay, we can't see the site anymore. Yeah, we'll be able to say, yeah, that's that's completely gone. Uh, but it's it's useful from a perspective of being able to go like, we don't have a GPS coordinate, but we have a most recent image and it's here. It's close enough, and that's. Uh, a few months or a year old rather than seven years old. It makes it easier on the pilots to find it. So you mentioned that you do training when you arrive? Yeah. Or when you arrive. Like, do you, what kind of training do you get? Like, is it medical stuff too? Because I imagine you're out there alone. Uh, so no medical stuff. Uh, usually we uh, try to do that here. Uh, we get uh, first aid and uh, like CPR training here. Uh, but the training, oddly the training you usually get is stuff about living in the Inferno. So like sorting your trash, um, how, how the different food areas work, how different areas work, um, how to drive vehicles and get certified to drive vehicles, and how to, uh, and then also meetings to coordinate with people to make sure everyone's on the same page regarding your plan. And then it's also days of like, okay, you have a bunch of gear that you have and a bunch of cargo that's coming. You have to sort all of that. So it's, it's a combination of trainings, uh, deep field training, which is like, here, here's how to work a Kuma stove, here's how to um, set up like tents and things like that. That's about a half day and then comms training. Yeah. But no uh, medical stuff usually is done beforehand and they ask you if you've got it because they're always interested in knowing who has some sort of training like that. Yeah. And if anybody wants, like I said, if anyone wants to know the name of Skomic, you can ask Dave. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a combination of, uh, so my dad and his late best friend um, like to canoe and stuff, and they found an island that they thought was their own. It wasn't their own, they weren't the first ones to discover it, but um, they, can, they decided to call it a combination of their last names, Skomic Seth and Elijah, so Skomic. Nice. And yet, as far as the rest of the names, usually it's named after people that were important to uh, Antarctic science, people that were important to our group, or and uh, or people that have passed away, or some combination of those three. No one in. Yeah, like I will never have a station named after me unless something horrifying happens. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>